Welcome. Lots of people here, and I think probably people joining us every moment. Welcome to you all, and I know that many of you have come from outside Oxford, but we are Oxford for Europe. I'm Geraldine Coggins, one of the Oxford for Europe team, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you, as well as our distinguished speakers, and I'm going to be chairing tonight's meeting. We have two speakers tonight, an MEP and an ex-MEP. And the theme is why Brexit isn't settled and why friendship matters. Our first speaker is a German politician and a member of the Green Party. She has been an MEP since 2014 and in terms of Brexit has spoken out as our friend. Indeed, she's a member of the EU-UK Friendship Group. In a speech in the EU Parliament in December 2020, she spoke directly to us in the UK, saying, our interdependence will always be stronger than Brexit. Our ties will always be stronger than Brexit. Our friendship will always be stronger than Brexit. Welcome, Terry. Hi, good to see all of you. Um, yeah, first of all, it's such a great pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm super happy about this invitation. And I have myself, unfortunately, never been to Oxford, even though I have been to the UK uh, quite a lot. Um, I actually did my Erasmus year in Edinburgh, and uh, I also went to school in England for a while, close to Margate. So for a very, very long time already, I'm an ardent lover of the UK. And um, obviously, as you can imagine, Brexit really broke my heart. Um, but ever since then, I've been trying to get Get to work and do as much as possible to keep the relations between the UK and the EU as close as possible. And this is also one of the reasons why I started um, this friendship group right, right after the elections in the UK when it became clear that Brexit would um, finally really happen. And I always have to say this because I'm speaking to a lot of native speakers. I'm only officially the, uh, I'm also officially the uh, spokesperson of the European Parliament for Weird English. I really give interviews on this already now. So if I say something that that sounds really weird to you. Please excuse my, my bad English and my horrible German accent. Um, I, I'm trying my best here. So uh, just to warn you a little bit. And I have been asked to speak a little bit uh, about the, the future for EU-UK relations. But um, before I go into that, I would like to take a step back because obviously what happened a year ago or now a little bit more than a year ago and what happened recently, um, I think is still we are still digesting, at least in the European Parliament. We miss our uh, UK colleagues dearly, and we very often think of the moment when um, we voted on the withdrawal agreement. And then, as many of you have probably seen, we sang together Old Lang Syne um, in the plenary of the European Parliament. And I think that um, when we look back, um, we can very clearly see, and this is maybe the first message I have or the, the first point I would like to make with the withdrawal agreement. We know that a lot of effort uh, has been put into making it possible, but we can already see now, uh, not uh, uh, well, just over a year after uh, its ratification, that there are a lot of difficulties in the actual implementation. And I believe that this is something that is going to continue now also with the Brexit deal. So with the deal, um, the trade and cooperation agreement for the future relations between the EU and the UK. So I always tell people when they ask me, well, now after the transition period is over, is Brexit finally done? I always tell them, sorry to disappoint you, Brexit is far from being done. There are still going to be a lot of issues coming up. This is going to be a very bumpy road because um, the things as they have been agreed and as we are now currently scrutinizing in the European Parliament, they, they still pose a lot of questions um, for the future relations. And I just want to maybe go uh, into some of them, because obviously, uh, when we look at the trade and economic relations, you can already um, feel the impact. Um, we can also feel it, uh, maybe not as much um, as in the UK, um, but that there are a lot of questions. There is a completely new uh, mechanism that has been introduced by the trade and cooperation um, agreement, this rebalancing mechanism, where we don't 
know how in practice it is actually going to work. So um, one of the things that we are really trying to strengthen in the European Parliament when it comes to the Brexit deal, because as you know, um, we are going to vote on it probably um, by the end of this month, um, is to have a strong civil society uh, engagement into these processes because we have the partnership council we are going to have a parliamentary assembly but we really believe that the problems they will come on the ground they will come in the businesses they will come with regards to workers rights they will come with regards to environmental standards and this is really something that has to be monitored and that also has to be monitored by civil society and i can tell you already from the experience of the last weeks and months i don't think this is going to be a uh, an easy process um, in the future, especially when we have a UK government um, that sometimes makes things even more difficult um, than they would actually have to be. Now, one of the things that I have been working on a lot um, and that probably also you have been following, maybe with the same regret as me, is the uh, UK's non-participation in the Erasmus program. Um, I can tell you I haven't spoken to a single person in the European Parliament and I would say in the whole European Union who are not regretting this decision. The EU made a very clear offer that the UK was welcome to continue to participate. The UK government unfortunately turned that down, even though Boris Johnson himself had promised um, that the UK would stay in the program. So this is something, especially as a student who went on her Erasmus year in the UK, um, I'm, I'm really uh, deeply regretful about this. Um, but at the same time, we want to see, um, for example, what options there are potentially for governments that are more open minded, like uh, the Scottish and the Welsh government, um, whether they can continue to participate. We are still in the process of finding out um, what options there might be. Um, so far, the Commission has not given the most optimistic answer to this. But what I felt was um, something in the letter that Ursula von der Leyen answered to a group of MEPs that ask about the participation in the Erasmus program that made me actually hopeful is that she very clearly pointed out that in case the UK government or any future UK government um, were to change their opinion, obviously, um, the UK could in the future um, participate in the Erasmus program again. And I think that this is something that at least from the European side, um, we try to work toward, uh, towards because um, when we look at the future relations, when we look at building bridges in the future and um, having something like the Erasmus program that can enable exchanges between um, people from the UK and the EU is absolutely instrumental and crucial for this. Now, if I look at the outlook and the future, um, obviously we are going to have um, the vote on the Brexit deal with all its ups and downs. I think one thing is pretty clear that the deal that the UK had as being part of the European Union was certainly the better deal because um, I mean, what the Brexit deal certainly brings is a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of special committees um, that didn't exist before. Um, but when we look at um, the future um, beyond the, the trade and cooperation agreement um, inside of the friendship group, we will try to do our best to um, yeah, not turn our backs towards each other, but really to try um, to, to build bridges in the future and to keep relations close. And for that, um, we are planning several networking events. We are planning um, to uh, again and again bring citizens groups and civil society groups into the European Parliament from the EU, but also from the UK, because we believe that there are a lot of potential channels that now with our UK colleagues being gone um, are not going, going to be so easy to use anymore. And um, so this is going to be certainly for us um, one of the one of the things that um, we want to keep going in the future, because as uh, Geraldine mentioned, um, I truly believe that, um, you know, no matter now with Brexit uh, having happened, um, we are still living on the same continent, we are still very close to each other, uh, and we will try to um, to keep these relations going. Um, and to build a future where I hope, and I said this in my last speech before actually Brexit happened in the, in the plenary in the European Parliament, 
um, that in my lifetime, I'm 34 now, I'm 33 now, um, I'll be 34 this year. Uh, in my lifetime, we will see uh, UK MEPs being re-elected to the Chamber of the European Parliament. Um, but for that, uh, I'm very well aware we will probably need uh, a little bit of a, of a long distance attitude. So we would rather have to run a marathon um, than a sprint. Um, but from the side of the European Parliament, we want to do everything uh, we can um, in order to work together with um, people from the UK, with parliamentarians, but also with civil society representatives um, to build a ground from which we can uh, make that happen again. And maybe I will finish here and then I'm super happy about your questions, what you are interested in about what we are doing, um, what are the debates, maybe also on the, uh, on the Brexit deal, uh, but anything that you would like to know. Very much looking forward to the debate. Thank you very much, Terry. That's brilliant. And I think we all know from what Terry has been saying that we can count on her to keep the light on for us so that we can find our way home. I can never say that without getting upset. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry, for what you said. And I think it, it, does, it does prompt a lot of questions. Maybe, uh, and I know we were going to ask about Erasmus. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, but there were one or two other things we wanted to ask about. Joe, can I, can I hand over to you and you could maybe ask the first question. Be okay. It's a question from Mike Cashman. And he says, Terry, we know and are so grateful for your work. What is the feeling amongst MEPs about the possible coming to closer of the UK one day, e.g. single market and customs union, or even full rejoin? If British politics changed, would MEPs welcome this or dread it? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mike, for the question. Um, I think that this is definitely something um, that we are obviously discussing because, as you well know, also this deal that we have now, this really short notice, you know, I received it on the second day of Christmas. And then basically for my Christmas holidays, I was reading a very long international trade agreement. So, so certainly the best Christmas holidays I've ever had. Um, and, you know, interestingly, our colleagues in the UK only had three days to go through it and then they already had to ratify it. Um, I don't know how they did that, but uh, OK. Um, no, but I think that already in the deal, we have this review clause, as you know, um, that after four years, um, we are going to look at the situation again and I think there is a lot of thought that was put into this because and this is now my well if you want to ask me what's going to happen in the next years I, I think that there is going to be a very a messy um, situation with this deal I think there are going to be a lot of difficult political um even conflicts, if not uh, friction um, between the UK and the EU, um, a lot of things are going to be much more difficult. And I think we have only seen the first step of how difficult this is going to be. I think especially for certain sectors of the economy, as you know, in the UK, the fishing communities, but I think we will also see other, other sectors that will really struggle with this. Um, and I think then with this difficulty, there will be a moment of reconsidering whether maybe another option like, you know, becoming part again of the single market to make all of these questions much, much easier um, would be on the table, especially when potentially there's going to be another government in the UK um, that might not be as hostile to the UN. I really have to say hostile because I think some things that the UK government um, has been well, in, in their positioning or also ministers have been saying, um, I have experienced as hostile. Um, that we can have a more rational debate and then in the future um, have a better agreement for both sides from my point of view. Um, so yes, I think there is a lot of openness uh, inside of the European Parliament towards this. And I think it can be obviously a big step, but it could also be smaller steps. Like as I mentioned, um, reconsidering the position on the Erasmus program. So saying um, that the UK um, would participate in the Erasmus program and in all other fields, um, obviously, as well. Um, I can tell you that um, with regards to the EU-UK friendship group, um, we have uh, members from all member states of the European Union. We have uh, members from all across the democratic spectrum, um, so from all, from all democratic political groups. Um, and there is really a very strong support for having close ties um, between the EU and the UK. Um, so I think that, um, yes, there is a lot of openness towards this inside of the European Parliament. Next question 
um, comes from Rosalind Stevens, and she's asking, um, Terry, is it possible that you could share more details of the EU UK Friends Group and, um, um, and how we could be involved in it? Thanks so much for this question. Um, I mean, I have now already said a little bit about the, the Friendship Group. Um, as, I, as I said, I initiated this um, after the general elections in the UK, when it was really clear that Brexit was going to happen. And we have um, four co-chairs from um, the Conservative Group, from the Liberal Group, from the Social Democratic Group, and me from the Green Group. Um, all the others are actually former ministers of their respective countries. So um, you also have a lot of governmental experience in this group um, and uh, we are trying to do various things so um, some of the events that we have organized were um, um, targeting uh, at citizens groups um, because you know there were a lot of concerns both by EU citizens in the UK but also EU citizens uh, UK citizens in the EU um, uh, whether their rights are going to be protected and there were also certain difficulties as you know um, this um, discussion in the UK around why EU citizens cannot get a physical document of their uh, settled status and to address issues like this and to still sort of like uh, be a, a debate forum also inside of the European Parliament for these citizens and um, we organized several events but we also want to expand that we actually already wanted to organize an action or like a, a meeting uh, last uh, September in London where we wanted to invite members of the well, several parliaments in the UK, so obviously from the House of Commons and the House of Lords, but also the Welsh Assembly, the Northern Irish Assembly and the Scottish Parliament um, to see a little bit how we can work together in the future. Because if I can tell you from my everyday experience, when we still had colleagues from the UK like Richard and others, it was much easier to work because you could just ask a colleague that was sitting next to you in the plenary, hey, I heard about this debate that was going on, how, how do you see that, what can we do about it and now obviously we always have to put much more effort into making things like this possible um, and this is why we want the friendship group to be sort of like a, a bridge builder um, for for the uh, different realities and one of the things that we are looking into now is also to try to bring uh, UK citizens in the debates around the Future of Europe conference. As you might know, the European Union is going to organize several citizens assemblies over the next um, months and years um, where we want to discuss with citizens how the future of the European Union can look like. Because as you know, Brexit also sparked a lot of debates about institutional reform inside of the European Union. I mean, I gotta say that if Brexit did one thing inside of the EU, it brought the rest of the member states closer together. So this is a very ironic consequence sometimes when I listen to Brexiteers who are saying, and we are only the first, and now a lot of other member states are going to follow and they're going to leave the EU. And then when I look at the reality that, you know, with this Brexit mess, actually the appetite for leaving the European Union and all the other member states has really dropped since uh, Brexit happened. Um, but nevertheless, I think there are certain lessons to be learned and also questions about how we can make the European Union uh, more social, how we can make the European Union more just. And for that, we are organizing this conference. And um, me and my colleagues, we really wanted to also still have the voices of UK citizens heard in this, because I think because of Brexit, there has been such a lively and vibrant debate around what it means to be a, a citizen of the European Union, um, what the EU maybe also, um, you know, what are the advantages or disadvantages of membership in the EU and so on and so on. Um, so I really think that this is a, a kind of knowledge um, that we can really use in the uh, Future of Europe conference. And this is one of the things that we want to push for also um, as a friendship group. And maybe how you can get involved, sorry for being a little bit long, uh, how you can get involved. Um, we have a newsletter um, that you can sign up to. Maybe I can later on post in the link, uh, post uh, the link to our website um, in the in the chat. There you can also see a little bit more about what we want to do, um, and then we can see then with actual events happening again um, how we can stay in contact. Um, because in the last month, I have to be honest, it was also a little bit difficult because of the Corona situation to organize actual meetings, as you all know. Um, this is a question from Nick Kennard, um, and it's a question about um, what do you make of the UK Labour Party's stance in not attempting to negotiate a better deal 
if it were to win power in future. Are those on the EU side as disappointed to hear that as the pro-Europeans on this one? I mean, probably Richard can say much more about this because I don't know the internal discussions in the Labour Party so well. But when I heard this, um, I must admit that I was a little bit disappointed because I think there are a lot of people inside of the Labour Party who have really fought against Brexit and who have then also really fought for a final say. Um, so to have another referendum about the actual deal um, and then to, to take a position like this, to me, felt a little bit like, like giving up on also these, these promises that had been made, that, there, that Labour would take a, a different position um, on how a potential Brexit deal um, could look like. And I can tell you from what I see, and I mean, I'm in the middle of the scrutiny process of the now existing Brexit deal. I think there are a lot of much better arrangements that the UK, much easier arrangements, much less messy and you know difficult arrangements that the UK could find um, with the EU. Um, so I hope that um, inside of the Labour Party, there is going to be another debate. Um, and then there is going to be a, a more open um, position also towards, um, yeah, reconsidering the, the UK's uh, positioning on some of the points in this Brexit deal. Thank you. I shall ask the next question, which is from Lizzie Price, who's one of our activists in Oxford for Europe. And she asks, how did the European Parliament react to the appointment of David Frost to the UK cabinet? It was quite controversial, I'm sure. Yes, I mean, I got to admit to you that there are several people now in the UK government where um, I think a lot of people in the European Parliament felt that um, they were really going against, if I may say, stereotypes about what we had of UK politics. Because I mean, if you grow up in Germany, there is a, a very clear picture of UK politics being very rational, being very pragmatic, being also to a certain extent, very trustworthy. Um, and now we have seen, I think a number of people in the UK government um, really taking very problematic positions um, and I would say really going against this traditional stereotype about what UK politicians are like, and I don't mean this in a good way. Um, so I think that, you know, there has been this agreement, uh, and I mean, you know, Michel Barnier as a, as a chief negotiator for the European Union didn't always have this easy that um, we have to deal with whoever is appointed um, by the UK government to uh, negotiate the, the uh, treaties and, and agreements with the, um, uh, with the EU. Um, we have to deal with that. Um, but at the same time, and I would say that this is true for a lot of um, member states inside of the European Union, um, the respect and the recognition of the role that the UK and UK politicians have played uh, on an international level has really gone down and a lot of trust has been broken um, over the past months and years. Yes, thank you. Um, it's a question from uh, Ruvi Ziegler, who is chair of the Oxford European Association, and his concern comes around the EU citizens who are currently living in the UK, now that the UK is a third country, um, how can they contribute, continue to contribute to and influence the European Parliament's agenda and policies? Is there a way that they can be assured a voice? This is exactly what we are trying to do uh, as the friendship group. This is why we organized meetings and bringing together uh, different citizens groups, um, like for example, the 3 million, but also British uh, in, in Europe, to be honest, um, to uh, make sure that they have a voice, at least in the debates uh, in the European Parliament, because I know that for a lot of them, especially because, you know, to start with, they couldn't even vote in the referendum. So they already felt very deprived of a voice in this process. But then also uh, in a lot of other instances, they just felt that their interests were completely neglected and that what they wanted um, was not taken into consideration, especially um, by the UK government. And this is why, um, obviously, we informally inside of the friendship group um, want to um, have them give input into what we can do from the side of the European Parliament. But we would also like to see, and this is what I was talking about when it comes to the monitoring 
um, of the uh, Brexit deal in the future, so the trade and cooperation agreement, that we would have civil society organizations that have to be included into debates around, you know, when there is some friction, when there is some conflict about something that you would have these citizens groups give input to this, because very often they are the ones who really know what is happening, what kind of problems there are. And I mean, now we have a regime how to deal with social security coordination, for example, but then the actual problems on the ground also have to be channeled into the parliamentary assembly, then the partnership council. And this is going to be one of the big asks that we are going to do uh, in the resolution that is going to accompany the ratification process in the European Parliament, that these citizens groups can also be included and will be included in these debates. I'll introduce Richard. He's Dr. Richard Corbett, CBE, and he's been showing his pro-EU credentials since he coordinated the Student Yes campaign for the 1975 referendum, which was to confirm that Britain would be part of what was then the, the European market. He was first elected as an MP for the Labour Party in 1996, and apart from a five-year gap, remained there until 2020. <clears throat> He's a former chair of the European Movement and is currently honorary vice chair of the movement. And if you are one of the people who receives Oxford for Europe's newsletter, you'll know that a permanent part of our useful information section is a link to Richard's brilliant website featuring EU Mythbusters. And if anyone here doesn't receive our newsletter, of course, they can sign up for it. But anyway, do go to Richard's website and look at this because he knows all there is to know about the EU. Welcome, Richard. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. The key point I want to make is that those British politicians who think that the Brexit issue is behind us, that it's done and dusted, and that it will fade away and we can move on to other subjects, are wrong. <laughs> um, it will continue to generate controversies in the months and indeed years ahead that cannot be ignored and which any, body, any political party in Britain uh, will not be able to keep quiet about or to ignore. And this for six reasons. <laughs> The first is that the Brexit deal is an incomplete deal. It leaves a number of items to be settled later, some in the short run, like um, financial services. It, it's pretty well silent on services, which is 80% of the UK economy, by the way. And financial services, it's left to unilateral decisions by each side to recognize the equivalence of each other's regulatory systems. Um, that is supposed to happen in the next few months, but um, it could have been perhaps addressed in the deal. So there's a huge element of uncertainty, and there will be, I predict, controversy just on that particular aspect, let alone other aspects of services, um, di digital, for instance. It um, still it provides for, but has not settled, the question of British continued participation in EU research programmes. Britain wants to continue with that, very important research programmes, not least medical research, but that involves negotiating what will be Britain's budgetary contribution to the, those programmes and conditions for participation not yet settled. Important, by the way, for universities, I mentioned since I'm speaking to Oxford for Europe. Um, whether Britain continues to participate in the emissions trading scheme, part of the follow-up to the Paris Climate Change Accords that we've done jointly in Europe, important thing, Britain can still participate in that. It wasn't settled, it wasn't worked out. That is still to be settled. I could go on with a whole host of different issues, There's, but let me just comment on, the, on one. The governance of the agreement, it provides for a partnership council. The British minister on one side, the EU on the other, 
which has the extraordinary power of being able to change the agreement, amend the agreement <laughs> without parliamentary approval on either side. Now, I know that in the European Parliament, Terry and her colleagues are seeking to get undertakings, and I'm sure they will get undertakings, that the European Parliament will be involved before any such changes are made. The British Parliament shows no sign of securing any equivalent. But the, so the parliamentary scrutiny of this is rather important. And there is provision for a joint parliamentary assembly. It's not mandatory under the agreement, it's provided as a possibility. Who will go on that for the British side? It's 50% MEPs on the European side, 50% MPs and Lords on the UK side. Are they going to be elected by the Commons? Are they going to be appointed by the government? Would it just be Boris Johnson's cronies on it? That will be another political battle. And of course, finally, there are various review clauses in the agreement, not least a comprehensive review that comes just after the next British general election. So that's the first set of reasons why the issue is not going to go away. It's the deal is incomplete. The second reason is that it's a bad deal. Where it does settle things, it settles them badly. It's um, but, well, I, I could go, give many examples, but let me just start on the economy and trade. Yes, it gives British goods, not services, duty-free access to the EU markets, and, but there are unavoidably controls at the border because we've left the customs union and we've left the single market. That was not necessary. Turkey is in a customs union with the EU. Norway and the other EEA countries are in the single market. But the British government chose to leave not just the EU, but to leave both of those as well. Now, if you are exporting into a common customs union from outside, under WTO rules, you have to have checks on the origin of the goods in question, to check that they really, really are British goods and not, say, Korean goods coming in via Britain to, to get around an EU tariff or rule with regard to Korean trade and the same with other countries. Those rules of origin checks are onerous. British firms haven't been used to doing that in their main export market, the EU, for, 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 for two generations. Paperwork, red tape, bureaucracy, and the need sometimes to check at the border whether the paperwork corresponds to what's in a lorry, for instance, meaning big queues and so on. Big hassle, damaging, costly to our economy. So it's a bad solution there, and we are already seeing many British firms complaining about this in many different sectors. That's on the economy. On security, Britain has left the police cooperation framework, Europol, the European arrest warrant, the, the uh, cooperation of law enforcement agencies. Um, for instance, and just one example, up to now, British police and border forces could check on a computer in real time, if they are checking somebody's passport coming into the country, for instance, whether they are on a wanted list, whether they're a fugitive criminal, whether they are a missing person as well. They can't do that anymore. That is a huge loss for, for safety and, and security and policing in Britain. It's a bad deal. And even, and this is a bit of gratuitous vandalism by the government, they've taken us out of the Erasmus student exchange programme. Many non-EU countries participate in that, this government didn't want it because they fear anything that takes us into a, uh, that takes our young people into close cooperation with Europe to, to get to know the rest of Europe, to make friendships, to, to, to fall in love across borders will tie us culturally to Europe. And they are also waging a cultural war against Britain being too close to its European neighbours. I could give more examples, but that's the second set of reasons. I'll recap. First set of reasons the issue's not going away is the deal is incomplete. Second set of reasons is because where it does settle things, it settles them badly. 
third set of reasons, it builds in conflict into the agreement. The access to the single market that I mentioned earlier is conditional on Britain maintaining the same sort of standards on consumer protection, workplace rights, environmental standards, product standards, and safety, health and safety standards, as in the EU. Because the EU did not want, understandably, British firms competing in their market on the basis of undercutting their standards in these things. So as long as we don't change and water down our regulatory standards, fine. But we have seen already discussions in the governments about watering down workplace rights, for instance. They've been discussing changes to the working time directive. They've been in agriculture already saying, right, we will accept certain pesticides and other things that are banned in Europe. If this goes on, there's bound to be conflict on that. Now, there's an arbitration mechanism, but if that fails, the EU has the rights to impose tariffs or even ban products from its market. So there is inbuilt conflict. There will be issues. There will be controversies coming up for months and years ahead. The fourth reason is that this government is actually looking to perpetuate conflict with the EU. It wants to keep on blaming Brussels to deflect criticisms of the agreement and saying it's all their fault. It's all these nasty Europeans being nasty to us. Um, and they want to keep a, a nationalistic culture war going against the European Union. Now we've seen that on We've seen that on um, big things like the Northern Ireland Protocol that they only signed um, just over a year ago and already want to tear up, making all kinds of claims that the EU is misinterpreting it, which is not true, to trivial little things like the status of the head of the EU's representation in London, where they don't want to allow the head to be named as an ambassador. Now, the EU has representation in 145 countries across the world. Everywhere else says, yes, that person is the ambassador of the EU. Only Britain now is suddenly saying, oh, no, no, you're not a state, so you can't have an ambassador. Now, that's a bit funny, isn't it? Because the, the Eurosceptics on the right wing, the Tory party, said they wanted to leave the EU because it was becoming too much like a state. <laughs> <laughs> about it you know now they're saying oh no it's not a state so you can't have them it's silly it's petty but the upshot is to pick a silly little fight with the eu to keep people up up in arms about it and you see it on the blame game as well they um george eustace the minister fisheries minister useless eustace i think he's called um has been complaining about the eu suddenly banning British seafood, if it comes from so-called class B waters, where there are problems of the, the purity of the water and pollution and so on. Um, this is not a new ban. It was, it's been there since 10 years. Britain was part of the EU when we agreed such a rule to, to protect the health of, of people consuming seafood. So it's not new, it's been perfectly known. And indeed, George Eustace's guidance to the sector sent out in December warned them about this. But now he's saying, ah, the EU has suddenly done this because they're being vindictive and nasty to us because we've left the EU. Nonsense, but it shows how they want to keep conflict going with the EU. Fifth reason is Scotland. One of the big issues coming up will be, again, the question of Scottish independence. I won't go into the ins and outs of that, but clearly one of the aspects is that the, Scot the Scottish National Party said it wants to leave the U UK to rejoin the EU. And it's understandable from their point of view. The referendum back in 2014, one of the issues was be careful. If you leave the UK, you'll be leaving the EU as well. It'll be a disaster. You'll be isolated. What happens then? The rest of the UK drags Scotland out of the EU against its will. Of course, the SNP is going to use that as an argument. It's understandable from their point of view. And to counter that argument um, in a potential new referendum, 
the rest of the UK is would be if it wants Scotland to remain would be well advised to say okay we're not we're not going to um, try and get even more distant from Europe rather the contrary we should get closer if they want to um, to do that so for that reason as well the question of Brexit will not disappear so that's five reasons and the sixth and final reason is that there are a lot of people many of them on this call who will not let the issue rest. We are not happy with Brexit. And actually, I'm not just talking about remoners like us. I'm talking about the victims of Brexit, many of whom actually voted leave, like those fishermen who were on the television three weeks ago saying they'd voted leave and they bitterly regretted it. There will all those people whose livelihoods are under threat or are damaged by Brexit itself and weren't expecting that, are they're not going to just sit back and say, oh, well, it was a price worth paying. I don't mind, or most of them won't. And they will be saying, that, and rightly so, hang on a minute, this isn't what was promised. That's not what they told us. This isn't delivering what they assured us would be an easy Brexit, where Britain held all the cards in the negotiations, and that it would save lots of money that would all go to the NHS, and that our trade would be unaffected. And those people should be given a voice, asking where, where are the benefits? Um, task as pro-Europeans in the European movement and the other pro-European organizations should be to amplify that message, not a Ramona message thing, we, we told you so, but amplify their vo voices, people, many of whom did vote leave, saying this isn't what was promised, this isn't what they told us it would be. We want, we, we have been let down, Brexit betrays Britain, they have let us down. And if we amplify that, then the shift in public opinion that we've begun to see already will be amplified further. Well, there's not been much opinion polling recently, but what there has been has already showed that a majority think that Brexit was a mistake. If we can get to the point where that becomes the settled view of the British people, of a large majority, that Brexit was a mistake, then we are in a far better position to argue at the very least that we should attenuate the damage by rectifying the worst aspects of the trade and cooperation agreement to, to rejoin uh, Europol, to rejoin Erasmus, to consider rejoining the single market and the customs union. And possibly, and I'm sure most of us would like that, to go further and say rejoin, because we can attenuate the damage by some of these measures by rectifying the deal, but we cannot eliminate the damage the only way to fully eliminate the damage of Brexit is to reverse Brexit itself. Now, we don't yet know whether we will be in a position to say that, but unless there are people like us actually going out there and arguing it, then the debate will not move in that direction. There will be a general acceptance that Brexit's happened now. It's, all we can do is make the best of it. Um, nobody, nobody is arguing for it. If the European movement isn't saying we should rejoin, then our opponents will say, oh, e even the European movement doesn't even speak of rejoining. It was the right thing to do to leave because nobody, nobody thinks it's a good idea to be a member of the European Union. So some of us need to take up that position, as it were, the outrider, making a vociferous case. And even if we don't win or don't make headway initially, that will at the very least give space to others to argue, to have a closer relationship, to rectify some of those bad things in the deal. That's the least it could do. But at best, it might help shift public opinion decisively. Never forget, British public opinion sometimes turns completely against something it initially supported. Remember Suez, remember Iraq. Nobody now thinks those were a good idea. Most people would say, oh no, how on earth did people think that at the time? 
if we can get to the point that people think that's about Brexit by a very large majority, then anything becomes possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. That was brilliant. And I'm sorry that you didn't hear what Terry had to say earlier, but actually you fitted in very well with her because she was talking about the importance of civil society and that chimes with what you're saying about changing public opinion. And it's we people on the ground, not the politicians, people like us at Oxford for Europe, and uh, we are just one of many groups all around the country who are working at keeping the, the, the flame burning for, for Europe and showing why it's important. What, what we've been doing is uh, asking Terry some questions. And uh, our audience has been submitting them and there are some moderators who will be now asking you some. And uh, Terry, you may want to join in with some of them too. I know Terry that you need to leave before the end. I'm imagining you will want to leave about 7.15, is that right? Uh, 2025, that's also okay. fine. I just have to be in the next meeting at half past, so. Okay. Um, yes. Thank but I don't have to go far. I just have to put on a different Zoom call. So, <laughs> Okay, you might want to get up and walk around first. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to our moderators now then who have some questions to put to both of you. Thank you, Geraldine, and thank you, Richard. That's, that was really inspiring and um, greatly appreciated. Um, this is a question for both of you, actually, from um, our dear friend, Sarah Murphy. Um, and the question is this. With our government and our press seemingly intent on fostering negativity towards the EU, how do we, with so little representation, protect our relationship and prevent public opinion from turning against it? Um, in other words, how do we keep alive the friendship and the potential for future cooperation? And I appreciate you've, you've touched upon this, but just maybe to um, give some examples of how we can best do that as, as citizens. Well, in part, the, the question refers to the hostility of the press and, of course, the government, and, and that is the challenge, how to campaign when you have a, a hostile government and a hostile media. Not, it's not very easy, and I think we, it's, it's a, an age-old question, by the way, on many different issues, but I think we just have to keep on plugging away with whatever tools we can get. Some bits of the media are more sympathetic. Even within this Tory government, some there are some pro-European conservatives who are uneasy about this. I, I always say that pro-European conservatives should be listed under the CITES Convention as an endangered species, mm. given special protection from their nasty predators. But the, some of them do exist, and we should encourage them. We should use social media, local media, and even the big mainstream newspapers sometimes are embarrassed enough to have to give some space to the other side, especially if they start getting letters and complaints and so on. All those traditional ways and, and sometimes novel ways on social media of campaigning, we, we have to use and go out. And I think the best way to do it is to work together with those people who, who aren't already in our movement, as it were, but those people uh, who I referred to earlier, the victims of Brexit, the ones who are going to be vociferous about, you know, I'm, I'm not a dyed-in-the-wool Europhile or Remainer, I even voted Leave, but this is terrible, this is a disaster, this is a mistake, and amplify their voices. Can I, can I maybe add, um, just from our perspective, I think one thing that I very often um, think about when I, when I look at my Twitter feed, um, you know, I think there is this tendency when you have people like Nigel Farage or some others now, also people from the government saying really um, hostile things or when there are takes, you know, by certain commentators that are really anti-EU, that people even from the Remain side or even from the pro-European side share them and then say this is outrageous and this is really bad. And I think the result that that has is very often that, um, you know, you kind of amplify the people who you actually don't want to be always in the center of who sets the agenda. So I think that for me, I have really tried for myself not to do that and not to, to share things like this anymore. If I want to make a point, I can make it, but I don't have to, you know, quote a tweet or even put a screenshot 
because people will know more or less what you know what the latest bullshit that Nigel Farage has been saying. So don't share uh, the hate because also I have the feeling that it does create a, um, a reaction. And you know I don't like to say that, but you know when there is so much hostility coming from the UK government, people like for example my parents who traditionally are super. UK loving, you know, I really grew up. Um, the most exciting thing was to go to England with a hovercraft. And, you know, my parents, we, we come from the region in Germany from the West uh, where there were still a lot of British so soldiers stations. So we were always listening to the FBS so that we would learn English. And, you know, like there was so much positive feelings. But now when they hear people from the UK government or also, you know, some of these um, hateful Brexiteers, and say anti-European staff, they really kind of change their attitude. And I think that this is something that is bad because we, for me, this is only going to fuel a more conflictuous and a more frictious relationship. So I'm really trying not to do that anymore. But instead, like Richard was saying, amplify the positive voices, the positive examples, the things that we want to see, like where, where people work together. And I mean, for me, it's very often very small things. Like now we want to do it from the friendship groups, um, we want to send letters to um, local communities, to cities, to villages, um, to uh, rewive their, their uh, partnerships with uh, cities in the UK. You know, there are a lot of twinning cities program and to, to get that going again, because obviously working together and exchanging is going to be more difficult uh, from now on. So we want them to put uh, a special attention to this also for association, to find partners in the UK to work together. And I think that this, really makes a difference when people have an experience of meeting somebody from the UK or for, for UK citizens to meet somebody from the European Union. This can break all this bullshit that is written in the, in the tabloid media. And then, and this is maybe something very concrete, um, what I also think, um, uh, or what we are trying to do as the friendship group, also to bring MEPs um, over to the UK. Um, also, obviously, to have former MEPs like Richard uh, making the case, but also to have MEPs from all different member states, because, you know, a lot of these narratives blaming the EU now for everything that is bad um, can be broken, I believe, best by people who are actually working on these matters and explain, you know, this is why this got into the agreement as it was. This was actually a negotiation position of the UK government. And, you know, with this, I think you can um, break this, this blame game that is being played. Um, and also, I think that um, we have a lot of people um, that, you know, in the work that they do and in the also the very open-minded and, and welcoming attitude they have towards the UK that already break this stereotype that, you know, now they want to punish us, now they want to take revenge, now they want to do this or that, um, because these MEPs, these people from the EU can, can turn the narrative and, and create a more positive spirit there. Thank you. Thank you both. The next question is from Jonathan Harris. It's aimed at Richard, but obviously, Terry, um, we'd, we welcome your opinion as well. And it's how should the UK pro-EU groups ensure that there's adequate representation for the joint institutions under the UK TCA? Richard. Yeah, well, some of those joint institutions are entirely in the hand of the government because it's British ministers or civil servants who will be on them. The, but not all. The parliamentary assembly, if it is set up, um, there'll be a battle over that, I think, at Westminster. I think the government will try and keep it very much in its hands. But if you look at how the UK appoints its representatives to the parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe, for instance, or to the NATO assembly, that's an election among MPs with a secret ballot. So there's a little bit more scope. I think they still have a formula for party balance, but nonetheless, there's, a, there's an election. So that's a battle still to be fought at Westminster and should be looked at very closely. But there's a third element, which is that the agreement provides for a joint civil society forum, um, which is common in a lot of EU trade deals. The idea is that uh, businesses, trade unions, NGOs, and so, so on interested in the agreement have a forum to, to discuss together, to submit proposals, to criticize things that are happening. And there, um, I, I hope there's a good wide 
broad-based participation in the UK, including NGOs, and the European movement should try and get onto it. But I expect the government will try and resist that and place its own cronies on it. So that's another little battle to be fought in the coming months. Thank you, Richard. Terry, is there anything you'd like to add to that question? No, I absolutely agree. And, and maybe just to say and to, to second with Richard, what Richard was saying earlier, I think the fact that we are going to have the scrutiny process inside of the European um, Parliament, we actually have the opportunity to get at least unilateral uh, assurances from the side of the Commission so that we can make sure that there is a stronger involvement of both the Parliament as well as civil society actors. And maybe this in the long run also when there is going to be a review of the government's uh, a, a governance of the treaty, that maybe if we can assure this on the European side already now, there is going to be more pressure for the UK in the future also to do something that is more participatory than uh, what is foreseen now in the agreement. So I think that this is also something for the next four years, probably there is not going to be so many like hard entry points, but after that, maybe there is a case to be made to say, look, this is what the European Parliament uh, got uh, inside of, uh, uh, of the uh, inclusion in the, um, uh, and you know, the partnership council and so on. So we should have something similar on the UK side. So we should also work together there and see what arguments can be made. Thank you, Terry. I'll hand over to Jo for the next question now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Hania Ozilik. And she says that um, the difficulties that are to come have been very much highlighted this evening, but the UK media is celebrating Brexit as a success. How can we raise awareness of the realities of Brexit when the media is giving such a distorted view? And Richard, would you like to take that one first? Well, it's it's a bit the point uh, that was raised with the first question. How, how do you campaign with the hostile media? I mean, Britain, it's, 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 it's pretty unique in Europe. People on the continent, in the European Parliament, people used to say, well, what's wrong with Britain? Why is it so Eurosceptic? And there's a lot of classical answers given to this, which are wrong. People say, oh, it's an island. We're different from everybody else. Yeah, but so is Ireland, so is Malta. Hi, Pris. Or be it's because we used to be a colonial empire. We look across the world. Well, so did Spain, Portugal, France. And they come up with all kinds of, uh, of answers like that. But the one thing that really differentiated Britain from the rest of Europe was the overwhelming hostility of the written <laughs> To the European Union. To the, nowhere else in Europe is it like that. Remember that 80% of British news, national newspapers, if you measure it by readership statistics, who have just four families owning them, by the way, uh, none of them domiciled in Britain, um, though they have a deliberate policy and have had for 20 years of being anti-European Union and seeking to denigrate the EU, um, making it look sinister or silly all the time. It's been a deliberate policy which drip, 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 year after year after year has of course shaped public opinion over the years. So it, it really is one of the, the biggest challenges. Now I know newspaper readership is declining, other things are coming up, but those other things aren't always balanced either. The BBC has not been very good. Um, it's a whole debate in itself. So we just have to find every way we can to get around them or to push them into giving at least a little bit of time for a different point of view. Yeah, and Terry, um, sort of you could add to that a little bit and as much as how does Europe react to our media and how it's, or is it not being particularly reported over there or are they quite shocked? Yes, honestly, sometimes I'm a little bit shocked, I must say, you know, the Daily Express recently called me an MEP from the Netherlands. And I mean, you know, like you can sometimes maybe make mistakes with directives sounding weird, and then you don't understand exactly what it's being talked about. But like this, you can fact check that on a Wikipedia page in two seconds. And I think it shows of the quality of the Daily Express um, that they didn't even have the time to check that. Um, so yes, sometimes I'm, I'm shocked and I think that Richard is absolutely right um, that this is something um, that played an important role. Um, and I think that, I mean, 
then again, I think there is this kind of, and I have this reflex as well that we want to react and say, this is wrong what they are saying, but then we already do what they want us to do. We already talk about their agenda. We already talk, like we are defending the European Union. And I sometimes have the feeling that this is exactly leading into the, into the wrong direction. We need to try to set an agenda that is coming from a positive place, that is coming from a, you know, talking about positive examples of where things are working well, where cooperation is functioning, what kind of advantages EU membership has. Um, because I felt that when I was coming to the UK during the Brexit campaign, there was a little bit of a sense of we need to defend why it is economically viable and good for us to be part of the European Union. And I think that now that we are in this situation, and I completely agree with Richard, um, we can, you know, create a narrative around what is, you know, a positive story to be told. Um, and I think that this is, um, this is the key. And if I may add, one of the things that really surprised me also a little bit um, when, I, when I came for the Brexit uh, campaign was that I think compared to France and Germany specifically, um, the, the whole narrative around Europe and the European Union being built after the Second World War and be really on the ruins of um, nationalism in Europe, this is a narrative that in the French and German debate is very, very strong. Like my grandparents, even if they weren't political at all, there was one thing that they connected with the European Union. And that is that the European Union is going to secure peace in Europe. This is the first and foremost function that this project has. And this is a narrative that I had the feeling, at least in the, in the campaign in, in, in 2016, wasn't really discussed. And I think that this is maybe one of the examples of how instead of just giving economic arguments, there should also be more maybe emotional, personalized arguments given in a future campaign to rejoin the European Union, because it's not only an economic advantage to be a member of the European Union, it's also a union that is based on, you know, common principles like democracy, rule of law, fundamental rights, and I think we have to make that point uh, if we want to go ahead. We have to catch the hearts and minds of the people, not just tell them what they're going to lose. Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, this is a very, a very pertinent question from Claire Campbell. She says, uh, I was involved in taking students and young people to visit the European institutions, including the Parliament. I see it as extremely important to introduce young people to the idea and project of Europe and involve them as much as possible. Is there any way in which the European Parliament can reach out to young people and students? And of course, this ties into some extent with what we were saying earlier about um, Erasmus and the fact that there seems almost an agenda to raise a, a generation of young people for whom Europe is not really in their in their bones or consciousness. Um, so maybe Terry could take that one first, if that's okay. Well, I think that this is something um, that we want to push for also in the in the friendship group. Um, I mean, we are not going to come up um, with a program that can replace Erasmus Plus because, as you know, Erasmus Plus has now become such a big and really, I would say, holistic program. It's not only about um, academic exchanges, but it also, you know, funds internships. It gives scholarships to people who do apprenticeships. It um, it supports cross-border activities of youth organizations. So there is a really a broad range. But obviously, on a smaller scale, um, we will try to make something like this possible. I think this thing about including UK citizens in the um, future of Europe conference, this is one of the maybe small pieces that, that can play a part there. But also I think what we have to try now on a political level is to encourage member states, regions, local authorities um, to make this possible. So to, you know, like my hometown Gelsenkirchen, which is the partnership, uh, which has a partnership with Newcastle and um, to say Brexit is gone now, we are not going to get a certain level of funding from the European Union anymore um, for creating exchanges, um, but we still want to invest there. And this is why we are going to come up with an exchange program. Program. And this is what we are trying to do and um, to write letters to, to mayors, to people in regional parliaments, but also obviously on the national level um, to make that possible, because I think the worst thing that we can do right now, and then really the Brexiteers are going to win, um, is when we stop the conversation from, from happening. And 
I think that this is something that we see as one of the crucial points that we need to um, invest in in the next month and potentially also years to come, that these sort of, sort of exchanges are still going to be possible. Thank you. Richard? No, I have nothing to add to what Terry said. Would you have time for another question, Terry, before you go or? Yeah? Absolutely, yes, yes. Okay, Susan, I think you're next. Yes, indeed. Um, it's, a, it's a question from Brussels, oddly enough, from Clementine, and she has asked, what chance is there of UK citizens with a withdrawal agreement residency cards living in the EU 27 of being able to be included in the Schengen, Schengen Treaty at some point? Yeah, the, the problem is that Brits living in other EU countries have managed, have under the agreement retained their rights to be permanent residents in those countries, but they don't have the right of onward freedom of movement to ah, okay, okay, okay. avoid in other EU countries. That depends on national decisions and so on. In terms of the specific Schengen reference, of course, um, they can move around between EU countries that are in the Schengen area without being stopped at the borders normally. Um, but no freedom of movement. That, that's a different question. But the rights of going to reside and live and work uh, in another country without further ado, no, there is a lot further ado and it's a lot of hassle, red tape and depends on permissions and so on. We've, we've lost that freedom. No, that's that's a, a good point. So maybe if it's possible, you could send me more info about it and then we will try to bring it up. I mean, even if it's not something that the European Parliament can decide because it's a national competence, and then at least we can try to get in contact with um, the respective member states um, to, to put pressure there. Um, so feel free to uh, uh, drop me a message there. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. I'll hand back over to Joe now for the next question. It's actually, this is directed quite a lot at Richard from Catherine Bearder. Um, which she says there's probably not quite enough time to get through to the full details of this, but the issue of free ports would be a huge problem to freeing up smooth trade. More stuff not up to EU standards leaking to the UK. What do you think about the issue of free ports? Well... <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's quite a big issue in its own right, whether or not you're in the EU. In fact, you could set up free ports even when you're in the European Union, um, as other countries have done. Uh, the, the big issue, though, with free ports is that you're offering um, businesses and trading businesses, especially a certain area in which they will not be taxed and may not have to apply certain other regulations. And of course, that affects fair competition even you know, forget the EU just within Britain, you're giving an advantage to certain areas and you're allowing, in many cases, I would say, multinational companies to avoid paying the taxes that they otherwise would. Now, what do you get in return for that? Um, the, the government would say, ah, oh, we get them to come to, to Britain and to invest in these areas that need more investment. Um, but is that really the case? Because multinational companies are very good at one thing, that's playing off one country against another and saying, look, if I go there, they're going to let me go there tax-free or give me this amount of state aid. If you want us to come to you, what are you offering? And they, they go around. And one of the main reasons for having common rules on competition and state aids across Europe was to prevent multinational companies playing off one country against another, where ultimately the richest country wins out. Put the same question to you, Terry. I mean, there are free ports across Europe. I, I don't know how sort of much of the public eye they are, but what is your feeling about either free ports in Europe or the suggestion of having more in the UK? Well, I think I, I agree with Richard there. Um, and maybe just, just to add one point, um, and maybe this can also add to Richard's list uh, because uh, to, to the six, six reasons that you have so far given, uh, maybe there is a seventh one. Um, and that is exactly um, uh, following up on what you have uh, now said on multinationals and playing countries against, against each other. I think when we look at the you know, global challenges that we are facing, and I think this whole question of inequality and what we can do against it and having tax systems that can actually also tax companies and they cannot avoid that so easily, but also issues.
issues like you know the tiny problem of climate change or global challenges to democracy and rule of law and when you look at how we can solve them working together closer and obviously first of all in your close geographic proximity so for example around your neighborhood so on your continent um, is one of the issues that I think we need to make sure especially in a world where these global issues are becoming more and more pressing and this is exactly what the European Union is giving an answer to because we can have stronger regulation on this we, we can agree on it you know we can sit at the table and then try to find a, a rules-based uh, system um, that uh, can make all of us stronger vis-a-vis -vis, for example these attempts by by multinationals to play countries against each other actually very recently there has been a, a success in the in the uh, uh, council of the european union on this uh, with the country by country reporting um that companies have to do when it comes to tax issues. This was a very controversial issue for, uh, issue for a very long period of time. And we can see that, you know, sometimes things might take a while inside of the European Union because decision making is tricky and sometimes very controversial. Things will get blocked. But in the end, it is a cross border, transnational, democratic project that can actually come up with solutions for very, very complex problems that can strengthen all of us together. And I think that this is something that in the future it's going to be even more important than it was in the past in a globalized world um, again with the challenges that are ahead of us and for that I hope that eventually you know with a little bit of a rational argument coming back um, to the debate in the UK um, it will also be obvious um, to a big majority um, of people in the UK why it makes sense to be part of such a um, you know, group of like-minded countries that you can come up with these um, rules uh, in a democratic way with. Well, I hope you keep telling people that all the time because this is exactly what we want to hear. Do you have a moment, just as one last question that Peter can put to you? Well, I was going to say at this point, um, because I know Terry has to go and I, I want to acknowledge her enormous contribution to this meeting. And, um, you know, she's ended on a somewhat positive note and I think it's great to do that and I think it is wonderful the contribution that she's making. I want Terry to know that not everybody in the UK is like uh, Boris Johnson, Nigel Farage, quite the reverse and uh, we like to believe that we are the majority and that will be heard soon. Um, but um, I think I just have to express my admiration for Terry not only for the hard work she does and, the, uh, and her steadfastness in maintaining links but also the fact that she has shown such phenomenal patience dealing with some of our uh, British uh, compatriots, both in Brussels and outside. And I'm aware that she uh, she needs to, to, to leave now. And I, I think we, we, we benefit from the fact that Richard may be with us for a bit longer because I know his budget is rather more time. So um, what I would like to do at this point is um, just um, before Terry goes on behalf of everybody um, to, to say thank you. You can unmute yourself now and applaud if you would like to um, before Terry leaves us. Okay. Thank you. You know, I feel so bad when this is when, when things like this happen because to me it's exactly the other way around. I can only applaud to you because I can tell you when this referendum happened, I woke up in the morning, I will always remember that day, and I was so heartbroken. I thought, you know, oh, I'm really? so desperate. Yeah, Why is this happening? Well. How could we not prevent this? You know, I was I was really I was really desperate. And then over the past years, you build this big movement led by citizens in the UK, mm -hmm. so strong, so vibrant, so lively, so pro-European. And it really gave me back all the hope that I thought I had already lost. And I think that you are doing something that goes beyond Brexit and be uh, beyond the UK, because you're building something that can be an example and inspiration to all of us in Europe, why this project is needed, why we should fight for it, and why we cannot be complacent, why every day we have to, you know, be vigilant and, and speak up against anti-European narratives, against anti-European rhetorics. And I can only tell you, I cannot clap with so many hands, but I, I clap to all of you for all the great things that you have done. So keep going. This story is not over. As Richard also said, Brexit is not done. We still have a very, very long story to write together. And I can tell you that I will always be at your side. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Terry. Indeed. You are the Thank personification you. of Europe. And yes. I want to be with oh, you. Coming down. Vielen Dank. 
a demon. I'm going to tell yeah. that to my French girlfriend tonight that you said that she's going to be happy about it. Yeah. <laughs> have yes. a Vielen herzlichen evening. Dank, Terry. Well, thank you very much indeed for that. But the next question is, is actually for, um, for Richard. And it's something that um, was asked earlier of, um, of Terry, and it's again from um, Nick Kennard. Um, he says, many of us joined Labour after December 19 to vote for Keir Starmer as a pro-European Labour leader. It's hard to reconcile um, the Labour stance that there will be no negotiation of the current deal and the aversion to raising daring issues with Brexit is, is, is galling. Not one member of the shadow cabinet makes these points about the single market of the customs union still being an option, uh, even after Brexit. Why not and how should we respond to that? The issue of Europe has always been a battle in Britain within political parties as, a, as much as between political parties. Um, and in the Labour Party, there is a, there is a debate going on because many people feel that Keir has not um, been as vociferous as he should be about criticising the deal or indeed in pointing forward to ways to attenuate that deal. And those views are shared by many in the Labour Party, including many people in his own shadow cabinet. Now, Keir's argument, I suppose, if I can try and explain it um, um, without putting words directly into his mouth, but to be fair to him, is that so um, at the moment, if if Labour was simply saying, oh, this is a disaster, we've got to, to turn it around, it wouldn't be listened to at the moment. Um, and that the Tories are, egg uh, are hoping he will do that because they want to continue their sort of culture war against, um, against Europe and against Labour and identify Labour with that. Um, but I think you will have gathered from my introductory remarks with those six reasons that I gave, I don't think that's a viable strategy. And I, I hope that the situation in the Labour Party will move. I hope that the situation in every party will move. Um, it has to, um, but, and I and others in the Labour Party will be, will be doing our best. Now, I spoke at a meeting, a, a similar meeting to this a few nights ago, and somebody told me they had just resigned from the Labour Party. And another one then piped up and said, and I've just resigned from the Liberal Democrats for the same reason. And I said, don't, whichever party you feel closest to, stay in it, argue the case, try and persuade from within those parties. Because one thing is sure about party leaders, they, whichever party, they generally listen more to people who are inside their party than to people who are outside their party. So keep in there, make the case, put the argument, put down resolutions or whatever, depending on your procedures and, and the, which sections, which branches you're in, and, and keep on making the case. It's very important. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, um, over to Susan. Lovely. Um, Richard, obviously this is a question for you again, so uh, you're, you're, you're under fire now. It's from Andrew... Hadley, and it's about the two big things of our time, which is Brexit and COVID. And the question is, how long will the government be able to go on pretending that all harm is due to COVID and that all recovery is due to Brexit? Well, that's that's their strategy. That's what they want to do. Um, and at the moment, it's with the media totally focused on COVID, um, it makes our task more difficult. Um, and they will blame the economic downturn entirely on COVID. We must take advantage of the fact that some of the effects of Brexit are manifestly nothing whatsoever to do with COVID. The difficulties facing our exporters, lorry queues at borders, bans on f um, the uh, sale of shellfish, leaving Erasmus, leaving Europol, all those things are nothing whatsoever to do with COVID. Um, and, and in those cases, we, 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 will, we, will, we will have to use that, but I think even the media can't ignore that. 
and people will see that to a degree. But there are other things, the gen general economic downturn, the raising in levels of public debt, they will say, oh yeah, this is entirely due to COVID and Brexit was a, mi a minor effect. And uh, we have to counter that argument. So it'll be more difficult in those cases, but um, the more people are out there saying it and pointing it out, the better balanced the debate will be. Thank you, Richard. I'll hand to Joe for the next question. Sarkozy has been sentenced to jail for corruption. Do you think Johnson will be brought before the courts on corrupt charges at some point in the future? Uh -huh. I, earlier today, I, I tweeted, um, look at France. Uh, dear USA, dear UK, I said, it can be done. <laughs> Put a link to, to the... Uh, story about Sarkozy. Um, the rule of law should apply to everybody and um, this shows that even if you're the leading political figure in a country that doesn't mean you're above the law. Um, can we get to that point with Johnson? Um, most, most of the things he says and does are uh, uh, suppose not directly breaking the law. They're just lies and untruths and exaggerations and, and so on. But uh, um, and it's deception and incompetence more than clearly breaking the law. I'm thinking aloud here. And anything you can spot, though, the better. Now, of course, the uh, Joe Maugham QC has been bringing cases against government. But they're not criminal law cases, of course, and they're against... Matt Hancock was found to have not respected the, the law in terms of publishing the contracts the, for COVID supplies with, uh, with different companies. Uh, but that, they're, they're not something you can go to jail for. Normally, it would have led to the resignation of a minister, but this government doesn't seem to believe in ministers um, resigning. By the way, talking of supplies of PPE and so on, um, I don't know if earlier with Terry you addressed the issue of the vaccination rollout and the procurement no, of vaccines, but of course that's an issue where the government is now trying to say, look how well we've done. We've, we're well ahead of everybody in Europe in terms of vaccines, at least for the first jab. It's different figures when you look at the two jabs. Um, and it's thanks to us not being in the EU who held countries back. That is a load of nonsense. The UK, when the government authorised the AstraZeneca vaccine for use in the UK, we were still in the transition period. It was in December. We were still subjects to EU law. We could do that under EU law because the relevant provisions said any country anyway can unilaterally take emergency action if the situation warrants it. So whether you're in the EU or out of the EU, it made no difference whatsoever. But what Johnson was doing then was taking a huge gamble, which has paid off, fortunately, but he, was, he authorized AstraZeneca before they had completed the full procedure of checking for its safety. Every other country in Europe decided to wait until that was done before authorizing it. The UK said, no, nope, we're going to authorize it already now. Thank goodness it paid off, because if it had not, if it had very bad side effects or if it wasn't actually very useful, we would have been in a pretty horrendous situation. That didn't happen, luckily but it was no more than a, a gamble, a risky gamble at that by the government. And it was nothing whatsoever to do with EU membership or non-membership. Thank you. I think we might be having one more question. Yes. Is that yes. right, Susan? Yes, it is. I'll, I'll ask it, um, uh, Geraldine. And um, the question comes from one of our members, Cathy, and it relates to the European movements, Richard. And what role would you like to encourage the European movement to play in the months and years going forward on this? And one little extra question to add on is, would you also support the movement that's running around the country at the moment in the upcoming census? 
that we put um, European on as um, an additional um, nationality. So over to you, Richard. Yeah. Well, I, I will certainly be putting European, definitely. Yeah, I, I think that's a nice idea. European movement. We are the European movement. If the European movement isn't advocating a position of saying this was a terrible national mistake, we need to at least repair the damage and preferably rejoin, then who else will? Well, there will be perhaps other organisations that will spring up and or strengthen themselves and do that. But it would be a huge gift to Eurosceptics to be able to say the European movement isn't arguing to rejoin. The European movement has given up on that. I don't think we can, as a European movement, give up on saying we need to rejoin the European Union. Uh, even, even if we may have to say not by the end of this year <laughs> or wait a bit, you know, as soon as possible, even if we say you can anyway in the meantime attenuate some of the damage by doing A, B or C, fine, we can say that, but we can never give up on the idea that we that Britain is better off in Europe and that Europe is better off with Britain, despite the problems Britain has sometimes caused. Thank you. Thank you. What a lovely note to end on. And it gives us all heart to fight on as we do. Thank you, Richard. And I'm going to hand over now to Peter, who's the chair of Oxford for Europe, to, um, to wind up, really. Thank you, Geraldine. And it just really remains for me to do some housekeeping and to thank both speakers. I mean, Terry, in her absence, for a magnificent um, piece of um, liaison, shall we say, between Europe and, and Britain. And uh, the more of that, the better. And to thank Richard for a very authoritative and inspiring talk. And I think I, I mentioned Geraldine and Richard in the, in the same in the same uh, sentence. Geraldine has been a wonderful chair. She also edits our newsletter. And I would refer you to that um, for a link to um, Richard's wonderful publications, his Brexit Miss Buster. Um, and uh, to say that- It's a bit actually, out of date now, I'm afraid. I've <laughs> updated for over a year, but- But um, I, think, I think you have been very authoritative on these, on these matters and it's greatly appreciated. Um, and uh, I think one of the, one of the um, uh, questions in the chat is what was, uh, what is Richard doing these days? I mean, it seems to me he's extremely busy and, uh, you know, acting as a, a linchpin of the movements and the more of that, the better. So we're very grateful to you for doing that. Um, and, um, you know, I certainly found it inspiring listening to you this evening. Uh, I know a lot of this is difficult and I think we have to draw what hope we can. Um, it's good that both speakers actually have been talking about um, the future in a positive way. Um, I hope, uh, I mean, I, I have no doubt that within Terry's lifetime, um, we will rejoin the EU. I, uh, I'm slightly more optimistic. I hope that within my lifetime, we rejoin the EU. Um, we hold out hope for that. Um, just, uh, I've been following the chat and there's a lot, a lot there that's of interest and people have been very active. Obviously it's been promoting a lot of conversation we're very sorry that this is not the kind of meeting where uh, we can uh, you know, sit around afterwards over a pint and discuss what we've heard, and that's a pity. Um, but the chat is there, and um, just by way of housekeeping, if you want to save the chat, you can. Um, when you go onto your PC or your um, iPad or whatever, you'll see at the bottom of the conversation, there are three little dots, and then you can click that and it'll say save chat, and it's set up in such a way that you can do so if you want. Um, so you may be able to, to read that at leisure. Um, I wanted to say a couple of words about our sister organizations. Uh, we in Oxford Europe are affiliated to the European movement, which is why a lot of the talk of the European movement is of great interest to us. Um, and um, we're also affiliated to Grassroots for Europe. And there's, uh, you heard from Ruby Ziegler earlier, um, there's the Oxford European Association. And for those of you in Oxford who are members of, uh, who are citizens of other EU countries and haven't heard of the Oxford European Association, I'd recommend it to you. Um, you'll find again a link in our newsletters and also uh, on our website. And we also work very closely with our friends at the um, European Movement Oxford branch. And I mentioned that because the next event that's coming up, which may be of interest to you, and we'll publicize it in our newsletter, um, is in fact um, a Ox European Movement Oxford branch meeting on the 9th. And the guest speaker there will be David Lidd Liddington. Um, and because we've talked a bit about um, enlightened conservatives, and I think he is still um, a, a conservative, albeit, albeit not an MP anymore, 
Um, but I know David Liddington will have a lot to say and that would be of interest to you. Um, and then the next meeting that we're organizing, um, uh, and I can now tell you um, for sure, is the 24th of this month. And our speakers will be uh, Leila Moran, um, whom many of you will know personally and wonderful MP for Oxford West and Abingdon, um, and the redoubtable Ian Dunt, um, how to be a liberal. Um, so both of those I think will be um, inspiring speakers as the two this evening have been. And um, I, I will ask you to show your appreciation the normal way. I'll leave just really to, to thank uh, Richard once again, um, and in our absence, Terry, for uh, I think a very enlightening and enjoyable evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.